So who is Tim and how did he get here? So thanks to my wife and my kids for allowing me this uh, journey. This is my second career. My first career was in pharmaceutical R&D. So I worked for a local pharmaceutical company in Lincoln for 29 years, uh, doing mostly new product development. Uh, so if you've heard of things like Theraflu, Excedrin, Triaminic, uh, Benafiber, Prevacid, those are things that I worked on in some capacity at one time or another. Um, in August 2015, or in, during the year of 2015, my company did a merger, a joint venture, and moved R&D jobs out of state. And uh, we decided that our boys were still in high school and we were not going to do that. So I took a severance package and decided to go back, back to school. So I started pursuing a master's in horticulture. Uh, during that time, I worked at Pinky Garden Center, which is now closed in Lincoln. I worked at the South Campbell's Garden Center for a couple of years. I did some contract work for my previous employer. And then last year uh, in May, a year ago, I completed my master's work um, this spring I've come as a Nebraska certified nursery landscape professional. And I've been here at Great Plains for about a year and a half uh, doing growing liners. So those would be number one, number three size trees. I also do a little bit of um, education work with our newsletter. And then I'm responsible for walk-in retail sales. When customers come in, um, because of my retail garden experience, that's very helpful. So this talk originally started as a talk to the Lincoln Garden Club. And so it was specifically concerned about trees in the urban canopy. So you guys are already here because you wanted to talk about trees and it looks like I have to be technologically equipped to Okay, so this started as a talk to the Garden Club, which is a mixed audience. And so this intro was, you know, why would we want to talk about trees? Eh, not interested, really. I talked to me about beautiful plants for my uh, patio, for the planter on my porch. Talk to me about vegetables, but don't talk to me about trees. Eh, not really interested. The uh, second uh, response might be trees. Why are we talking about trees? We've got plenty of trees. I know we have plenty of trees because I raked up all the leaves, right? Finally, trees. Yes, let's talk about trees. And so here today, we're talking about trees. Um, academic studies confirm that we are losing tree canopy in urban areas. And this is not just a United States thing. This is a global thing. And in uh, direct relationship with the loss of urban tree canopy, there is an increase of impervious cover. So streets, parking lots, uh, perhaps uh, gravel lots, anything where trees are absent and we have no uh, particular greenscape. Why have we lost tree canopy? Uh, in use today with emerald ash borer. Uh, we've seen loss of Scots pines, which is not so much an urban issue. Uh, aging canopy. So trees are getting old. I live in Havelock in Lincoln, and that is an older community. And you know, trees are just getting old. Uh, my house was built in the 60s. Uh, I removed a tree 10 years ago that had lived its life and needed to be taken out. I did replace it with something. My neighbor across the street yesterday just took out a very large red oak. Uh, it shaded the south side of her house, but it was also destroying the sidewalk. So it was something that had outgrown its space and it was taken out. And I think there's an issue of how do we replace these. Urbanization. If you look at developments and depending on where it looks, I mean, there may be some care that's giving to, given to re-greening spaces that are becoming uh, perhaps commercialized. Uh, if we look at expansion of urban areas, expansion in Lincoln, expansion in Omaha, we see areas that were once agricultural land that may have had some aspect of windbreaks, may have had some back aspect of uh, wooded valleys, wooded gullies, wooded canyons that added some green scape to them are now been scraped of the topsoil, been converted into houses and urban lots and streets, and trees aren't going in quite so fast. And so there's a, a dearth of trees. And I clicked the button accidentally. Um, what was the last one? Weather events. So here's Dutch elm disease. Here's what Dutch elm disease looked like before it came through these magnificent 
alleys of elms that have been completely wiped out. And we have emerald ash borer. There's our friend there that is doing the same thing to ashes. And as you drive through, and I'm not sure what it is in Omaha, but you can see the red circle of death on the ash trees along streets that are going to be quickly targeted for removal. Um, this was from, I believe, August 2020 in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So we have a completely mature tree that was just wiped out by a derecho. So these events are removing trees. And in some cities, uh, we, you know, we saw hurricane or sorry, tornado in Mississippi earlier this week that probably did the same things to all their trees in that community. So what's what's the big deal? We're losing our trees. So what? Um, well, there's an academic study that matches every one of these bullet points that says that trees are beneficial. And I think some of them we are probably familiar with, right? So we know that trees provide trade. They provide a cooling effect by transpiration, transpiration water leaving their leaves. Uh, those in rural communities will know that trees are valuable as windbreaks, snow, soil, uh, just comfort around your home. Uh, wildlife and insects, we know that there's berries, fruits, nesting habitat. Uh, for insects, we know there are insects that prefer certain species. They raise their families there and serve as the, the foundation of the food chain for local birds and other wildlife. We now understand aesthetic and economic value. Aesthetic value it raises the, you know, the appearance or increases the value of our home. It, it adds a nice aesthetic touch to the fronts of our homes, the backyards of our home. Economic value. I looked at a couple of different studies that showed shopper preference for tree or areas that were uh, shopping districts that were more tree, more uh, appealing uh, versus those that had didn't have as many trees or were you know, primarily an asphalt parking lot. Rainfall infiltration and soil retention. We know that roots, the presence of trees, and you can even imagine that. Uh, the canopy of a tree intercepts rain, and I don't want to get the two terms uh, intertwined there, but the, the rainfall interrupts the, the downfall of the rain. It, it lessens the impact on the soil and helps increase water infiltration into the soil. A water rainfall interception, the last bullet point there, is about how much rain or how much water can a canopy of a tree hold on its leaves by surface tension, how much can it hold in the bark? And there's been multiple studies done, or at least one or two that I found that tried to make a connection between tree canopy, rainfall interception, and stormwater runoff. And there was some connection made that there was definitely a, a connection, a, a small connection. Most of those papers also talked about inadequate research, that there was more research to be done uh, there was a direct connection between the, the type of rainfall. Was it a small sprinkle? Was it a small drizzle? Or was it a hard downpour? And when the downpours occurred, the correlation was lost. The, you know, I think the trees were unable to affect stormwater runoff significantly. And in doing that last bit of research, I also found a couple of articles that talked about how leaf litter in the gutters that go into the storm sewer system do contribute or can contribute to eutrophication of urban waterways because of nitrogen and phosphorus. So not so beneficial there, but something to keep in mind. So what can I do? So as a homeowner, as a person that's involved in the green industry or the tree industry, what can I do? Um, I found this particular saying, and there were lots of sayings about trees. Some were off color that would not have been suitable for an audience. But nevertheless, there were plenty of tree puns available. So the best time to plant a tree is 25 years ago. The second best time is today. And that makes sense. I think we understand the length of time it takes to get a tree to maturity. We see what size they are in the nursery. And we see the trees along the parkway or along the street or in parks. And we understand that there is a time gap there, a significant time gap. So we want to be successful. Why, why do we want to be successful? I think we understand the investment. There's an investment of time. There's an investment of money. I think we understand there's a length of time to maturity. And this, you know, depending on if this is a single tree in your backyard or perhaps a park planting, we have an understanding that this is a project. And none of us want to have a project where we get five years in and it goes off the rails and we have to start over again. So we want the project to be initiated well. We want the project 
to make it to its end point and we want the project to last for a while. And so we want to be successful because we want it to go well. It's a key pillar of the landscape, uh, you know, depending on if it's new house or you've removed a tree, you're adding something back in that's going to be there for a while. And so you want it to be there for a while. And all of these points are intertwined, uh, you know, maybe teasing them apart is uh, not so easy, but you can, you can see how we're trying to, to get to an end point and only have to do it once. And then finally, we're thinking outside of ourselves. I mean, the trees may be for ourselves, uh, but they're primarily for kids, grandkids, the environment. Because if you plant a tree right now as a number seven or a number 15, uh, it, it's going to be a while before you know, it, it becomes its mature self. So how can I be successful? I think there's some key steps to being successful. Uh, I think the first thing would be to pick some native or regionally adapted species that stand a better chance of success in Nebraska. We want to pick a healthy root system. We want to right, we want the right plant, right place, and we want to plant it well, and then we want to love it well. So native or regionally adapted, what, what does that mean? So as a native Nebraskan, someone that was born in Nebraska, I understand what a runza is. I understand what Dorothy Lynch is. I understand why people wear foam, foam corn cobs on their head. And I understand that chili is most properly eaten with cinnamon rolls, right? So as a native, I understand these things. And I think we can say the same things of our trees, that they have lived, grown, and reproduced naturally in this region. They understand what's going on around them in our area. Um, and the textbook definition is also no human intervention. They weren't necessarily brought here. And the easiest way for me to picture that, which is probably not an academic definition, is that if Lewis and Clark got off the boat and drew a picture of it, that's a native, right? And so I'm sure someone in academia could challenge me on that, but that's a way for me to picture what native is. We also talk about regionally adapted because if we go to the last bullet point, which probably should have been the first bullet point, um, you know, in a prairie ecosystem, especially as we move farther across west, across Nebraska, we don't always have a great selection to choose from. So then we begin to look the edges of our zone and find trees that live in similar plant communities that maybe are experiencing similar climate weather patterns. And so that would probably be defined as the climatic zones that are closest to us, maybe zone six or zone 5B to the south. We could begin to look at uh, zone four above, but maybe it's not so happy with the heat. So we kind of look to the edges and find things that might work for us. So why do we pick natives? Uh, I think the biggest reason is we have uh, a plant that understands the climate and comes from this climate or has provenance from this climate. We have uh, plants that are familiar with disease or insect tolerance. Excuse me, let me say that different. They, they have exhibited disease or insect tolerance or resistance. Uh, they tend to be pollinator friendly, especially to native insects. And then they serve as insects or lava hosts. Again, I've found multiple bullet points that are probably maybe two real bullet points that I've turned into four. Uh, so native trees can express genetic diversity, especially if you go from a seed grown source, you have open pollination and you have the diversity in that population, just like we would see diversity in the human population, as opposed to clone cultivars that are the exact same tree that are vegetatively propagated, that are the same one after another after another. Uh, native trees are adaptable. And we talk about the concept of provenance. Where did that seed come from? Where was that seed developed? Where were the generations before that seed pollinated and grown to maturity? Um, it's pretty easy to find bur oaks in landscape, uh, sorry, in garden centers. That bur oak may have come from Washington or Oregon. So yes, it's a native tree by definition, but it's not the same tree as you might find from a locally seed source grown uh, bur oak here in Nebraska. And then finally, ecosystem familiarity. And I just made that word up. That's why it's in, in air quotes there. Uh, because it is a tree that has evolved, developed with 
local wildlife, local insects, local diseases. And so there is this give and take that goes with that. We have some of that in our own nursery here where we have native insects that are attacking, if you will, native trees. And so then you've got a conundrum uh, from, an, from an economic from a business perspective. Do I control, how do I control a native insect that is attacking the native tree, which is the only home that it's ever known? So, I mean, it doesn't hurt the tree necessarily. The tree learns to live with it. You may lose a tree here or there, but for the most part, there's this give and take that the trees have figured out with the insects. And here is, you know, kind of a pictorial view of genetic diversity and adaptability. You have some elms there that are showing some despair and degradation that will eventually would have been taken out. And then you see a row of Scots pine there that were uh, taken out by our pine sawyer beetle. Another aspect would be local fauna, local insects. So the works by Doug Tallamy, his research has indicated the, the value of native plants, native, various native genera to local birds, local insects, and how that is the very foundation of the food chain. So a healthy root system would be the next piece. And here at Gray Plains, we use uh, the root maker system, the root trapper system, which has been the subject of continuing research since 1968, which purpose is to develop a fibrous root system. So the fibrous root system develops or minimizes circling roots. It increases root tip surface area that results in greater water and nutrient absorption, which results in faster establishment of the tree. And so here's an example of a fibrous root system that is, this one happens to be a sycamore tree, but it uses air pruning, uh, root entrapment and root constriction to create the fibrous root system and which results in a tree that has all of the roots that ever had, as opposed to a tree that's been field dug. You have increased branching. So I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit here, but we have greater surface area at the root tips where the vast majority of nutrient absorption occurs, the vast majority of water absorption occurs. And so you have a much larger surface area for absorption that results in faster establishment, plant growth, increased vigor, rapid transplant success, and uh, long-term health. You've got a plant that started off well, it's ready to grow right away in, versus a plant that may have been uh, dug from the field and is still reestablishing its root mass. You have here a plant that's ready to take off and ready to go. You see here something that you've probably seen multiple times, the, the effects of a smooth wall container where you know, in this particular case here on the left, you can probably clean that up a little bit and get a tree that's going to take off. It's still going to have to recover. Where the tree on the right, the root bag system or the root maker system, you can see the fibrous roots. The tips have been revealed. That tree is ready to go when that tree gets planted. So right plant, right place. What are our primary considerations? Now, my primary experience with right plant, right place is in urban environments, just working with garden center customers. And one of the biggest ones is size. Um, and the question is, yeah, but I can prune it to fit. And the answer is yes, you can prune it to fit. But the second question is, should you be pruning that tree to fit? You need to be finding a tree that fits in the space that you have. Even if Pinterest or Etsy tell you something else, you need to find a tree that fits in the place that you have. And so then you also need to consider site characteristics, uh, sun and shade exposure. You know, do you have hot sun in the afternoon? Um, do you have warm, low sun in the, in the uh, winter that could affect something? Do you have primarily shade that could be shade from a structure, a building, a barn, a house, whatever? It could be shade from canopy. What about summer or winter exposure? Uh, there are a lot of ornamental trees that are sensitive to placement. Uh, you know, if I think of Japanese maples, if I think of some of the variegated trees, you, know, you have to watch where you, excuse me, you have to watch where you put those. Um, what about uh, some evergreens in winter winds? You know, you have to watch where you put those. So those things have to be taken into consideration. And then soil type here in Eastern Nebraska, we've got primarily clay, I guess, as we get into the valley towards Iowa, we get a little more into lust. But right here in southeast Nebraska, around Lincoln and Omaha, we've got clay. 
And then moisture. Is it a dry site? Is it a low spot that holds moisture? These are things that we need to consider. Some other considerations, and this is where you know, we get to pick what we like. You know, we have to make sure we have a plant that's going to thrive, but then maybe out of that subset, is there something that's got a nice bloom? Is there something that has nice fall color? Is there something that has multi-season interest? Do I get uh, some structure out of the tree? Do I have some nice exfoliating bark? Uh, do I have persistent fruit that may be interest to birds or wildlife? And as we get into natives, especially natives that are not cultivars, that are straight species, you have the potential for mess, right? So fruit, maybe fruit that just falls itself, or maybe it ends up having been processed by a bird and ends up on your car. Um, seed pods, marcescent leaves, leaves that, um, especially on oaks, that don't fall off in the fall. And so you get to rake a little bit in the fall, and then you get to rake a little bit in the winter, and then you get to rake a little bit more in the spring. So, you know, that can be something we need to understand. And I think finally, the right plant, right place needs to be thoughtful incorporation into your landscape. And I could have easily highlighted into as well, because I think the first thought about trees is, okay, I have a uh, my parkway, my terrace between my sidewalk and my street is empty. I'm I'm going to get a street tree voucher and we're going to fill in that spot. And that's my tree. Or I have a spot in my front yard and I'm going to get a tree. And I think if we add some thought to that is how can I combine or how can I put a tree into my landscape, into an established landscape? And so hopefully today we can talk a little bit about some layering or maybe some ways to do that. And then finally, we want to plan it well and love it well. And I get a lot of questions here at the nursery about when's the best time to plant. And so we're coming into spring and spring is certainly an okay time to plant. It, you know, it has its caveats, right? In a clay soil, the soil warms up slow. Uh, it's hard to work. If you work it too soon when it's wet, you end up with a bunch of bricks. So you have to understand, you know, what to do with clay soil. If you use an auger, you get a little bit of shear on the side of your pole. And you got to take care of that. Um, but you got an entire, you have an entire growing season for the tree to get established. And if you understand that, uh, then you can work with it. Summer, I would generally tell people not to plant trees in the middle of summer. I would go to the weekend. I would go to your lake house on the weekend and save trees for another time versus fall. Fall is probably the best time or maybe even ahead of spring. Um, the soil is a little bit easier to work. And we're getting into a time where the tree still has an opportunity to get established without the everyday pressure of heat and drying winds. Um, so maybe fall is a little bit better, but you can make all of them work if you understand uh, the boundaries that go with each one of those seasons. Soil preparation. Uh, if we talk about clay, it sure would be nice to add some amendment to some of the clay, especially in an urban area where some drove their bobcat over it. And then they, you know, they drove the backhoe over it to dig the hole. Then they drove the bobcat over it to do the final grade and it's compacted. So it'd be nice to get some compost in there to prepare the soil, to work it a little bit, to make it just a little bit more friendly for that tree as it gets started. A uh, depth, you know, let's get it planted at the right depth, uh, not too deep, not too shallow. And, you know, there are ways to help us do that. We can look at the root flare on the tree and make sure we get it to the right place. What's the process? How do we backfill? Well, we don't stamp on it with the back of our boot. To, to backfill it, we do a, maybe we let the water tamp in, maybe we do a hand tamp, just enough to make sure we're not exposing roots to, um, to air once things have settled. Staking, depending on the size of the tree, staking could be critical. It may not be so critical depending on where it is. If you're inside an urban area and you have a young tree with a good caliper and that's been pruned well, uh, maybe you don't need to stake. Maybe it's going to be just fine. If you've got a tree that's between two houses that serves as a wind tunnel, when the wind blows from the north or the south, you're going to want to make sure you get it staked. So those roots have a ch chance to establish without being interrupted by being uh, tossed about in the wind. And then finally, watering, mulching, guarding, and caging. Uh, and for you guys here, you know, the, obviously the turf sprinkler system is not enough, but communicating that to customers, communicating that to homeowners that are trying to get trees established, 
helping them understand the difference between your tree roots and turf roots is critical. Helping them understand the value of mulching, helping them understand, especially in rural areas, the value of guarding and caging. Um, you know, deer don't care what, how much you love that tree. Deer are just looking for a place to scratch the itch, right? And so uh, we had an incident here, not here on site, but a custom where deer wiped out about 200 feet of a, a row of conifers, newly planted conifers, because they weren't caged. She just went along from one to the next to the next and took out all of the leaders. And um, so I found that concrete reinforcing wire and uh, T posts tend to be pretty deer resistant. So here's a picture of tree planting, proper tree planting. I think the biggest things would be, we see that the root ball is not any deeper or the hole is not any deeper than the root ball. And we really try hard here at Great Plains when we're shifting to make sure we've got that tree planted at the right depth so that it comes to our customers planted at the right depth. And it's pretty easy for us to say no deeper than what you see here. Uh, other key points would be mulching. Uh, make sure you've got mulch that guards moisture, suppresses weeds, mulch that is not up on the bark of the tree. Uh, some kind of guarding uh, in an urban environment. Well, even here at Great Plains, we had rabbits who just went through and just nice 45 degree cuts over you know, tens and twenties of trees right in a row. They just went from one to the next to the next. And so in an urban environment, uh, caging is probably a good idea. I, even at my house, I had the cat, the local cat scratching on a, a tree that I had to guard. You know, the rabbits never bother it, but the cat decided that, yes, I need to, to do a little manicure here. And they did it on my tree. So uh, staking, we recommend T-Post. You could probably get by with a smaller version of T-Post uh, that you can find at Home Depot or Menards or wherever. It doesn't have to be the heavy duty T-Post. But you, the key point is some kind of large diameter or braided rope or, or structure up against the tree trunk. We don't want a thin diameter wire up against the tree trunk. Uh, my boss here, Heather, and I both visited trees this past weekend where someone had used rope right up against the trunk of the tree. And in my case, the rope is still in the tree. I couldn't get it out. Um, the one that Heather saw, it, it's just a divot. You know, who knows how long that tree is going to be uh, viable. Uh, the plumbing of the tree is right underneath the surface of the bark. And that, that mark that was left on that tree was obviously much deeper than that. So that, that tree may not be much longer for this earth. So let's talk about some specific trees. So I tried to find a variety of small, medium, large, and these are not necessarily the top 10 trees you should plant in your yard. Uh, these are trees that I happen to like, that happen to fit the uh, direction that I was going with the talk. They are either native or regionally adapted, and I think they work. I think you can find a spot for them. So I put this diagram in, and I wish I could have changed the color. I couldn't change the color. For those of you that have a math background, this is a normal or standard distribution, distribution curve of a, a represents a variable in a population. And the reason I put it in here is because there are differences of opinion in this world, right? And uh, you could label this slide the foundation of civil discourse if you wanted. Uh, because on the right hand are the people that drink their coffee black. And on the left hand, there are people that drink their coffee with... Uh, whipped cream, caramel, and a little bit of sea salt, and everyone else is somewhere in between. Um, this could be your politics. And this is also probably in this discussion, this is what people think of native trees. Some people may think only natives. You know, if you're not planting only natives, you're doing a disservice. Now, on the other end, there could be someone that thinks, oh, I like the flowers, a tree that's from a different zone or from a different country and you know, other people are in the middle. So if we have this understanding that there's differences of opinion, I think that's important, especially when our choices you know, in our yard have an impact on others because trees won't necessarily respect boundary lines. You know, they may get, you know, some of our leaves may fall in the neighbor's house. Some of our, the berries from our tree may get processed by a bird and land on the neighbor's windshield. So 
understanding differences of opinion and understanding that there are others will have different opinions, I think is pretty critical. So there's a question. Okay. Is the curious about seedlings. Is it best to put them straight in the ground or pop them for six to 12 months? So I, I think what you're gonna find with the seedling, depending on what it is, I think if it's a, a relatively young seedling, say you found it in your fence line. I mean, I would, it's got a root structure established as a seedling in that spot. So I would get as much soil as you think you can get around there to capture as many of those roots as possible and move it to its place and then just kind of swap soil for soil. So I dig out the same size soil ball where I'm putting it and put it back in the hole I took it from. Uh, certainly around here, you know, we have our seedlings and they go into air prune pots. Um, I wouldn't take it out of the ground, put it in an air prune pot and then go replant it. I don't know if that answers the question or not. You, you will find that if you've got a tree like a mulberry or an elm or something like that in the fence line, it's gonna send a tap root down. A hackberry is a good example. And it's gonna be hard to get all of that out. Um, you can try. Some are gonna transplant better than others if you're looking to transplant. So be aware of that. Uh, the older the tree is, the longer the tap root's gonna be because that's what native trees do. And it's gonna be harder to move. Um, so this picture here is a picture of what native trees do. Now you can find a lot of landscape cultivars that don't do any of this. You know, they may not have pods, they may not have seeds, they may not have fruit. And they were bred specifically for that, for environments for people that want to deal with the mess, right? If you adopt native trees, um, you're likely to have a mess. And, you know, one man's mess is another man's pride and joy, right? And, you know, if you live in a some kind of a community that has a homeowner's association, you know, the homeowner's association may take a very dim view of all of this. And so that's something, there's some education opportunities, perhaps some op to opportunities to work on your conflict resolution skills, um, but that's what happens. So let's get started. I'm gonna start with small stuff, and then we're gonna move up to big stuff. So one, the tree that I really like, is the Eastern red bud. Now you see it a lot in Lincoln and in urban areas as standalone street trees, which they work as standalone street trees. I think they're on Lincoln street tree list. I think they're on Omaha street tree list, um, but they're their best place as an understory tree. And the best example that I can think of that I've seen recently is at the Omaha zoo, the Henry Dorley zoo. If you walk in the zoo, you walk down the hill past the jungle, and you take a hard right, they have a little birthday hut back in there. And the pathway that goes back to that birthday hut, underneath the canopy, there is a beautiful red bud. Uh, it's all layered. Uh, the branches are long and, and horizontal. It's just an absolutely beautiful example of a tree that's living exactly where it wants to live. And you can see here the appeal of the red bud. These are early, as you can see the leaf is just emerging. So the flowers come before the leaves. And when it's bare, you can see the, the layered structure. You can see the zigzag branches. So the red bud has a place in the landscape. I think if we could find a place to tuck this under trees, if we have a, an oak that has been limbed up perhaps, or, or some other places where we know we have a high canopy or we get some afternoon shade, rather than sticking the, the red bud out in the front yard of a newly developed um, of a newly graded development all by itself in a piece of clay, I, I think we get a little bit more out of the red bud than we do if we just put it where it wants to be. The prairie fire crab apple, this is a regionally adapted species. Most crab apples are no longer straight species. This is a grafted cultivar, uh, but it works well in Nebraska. It has multi-season interest. You can see the spring bloom you'll have persistent fruit, and then you get some very nice fall color out of this. You have um, a nice purple bark, a gray, gray to purple bark, burgundy perhaps, depending on your color choices. My wife still dresses me before I have to go anywhere important, so I have to be very careful with my words about color. Um, so both the red bud and the prairie fire crab apple are in the 20 foot range, 15 to 20 foot range, both 
high and wide, you can see their canopies, they're kind of rounded, maybe a little bit broader than they are tall. But these are small ornamental trees that would work in a front yard, they would work in a corner of a yard. These are trees that would, they don't necessarily have to be the big tree in the front yard. You see here the blooms, these happen to bloom after the leaves come out. So a little different bloom time. So maybe it looks a little bit different. You get a little bit of green mixed in with your pink. So it's a little different color. Another option might be the Canada red choke cherry. So this is a selection of a seed selection of the native choke cherry. Um, I couldn't find a picture of the, the Canada red choke cherry with the with blooms. So the picture there on the right is a regular choke cherry with white blooms. The, the bloom shape is the same. You don't get a whole lot of fruit with Canada red, but you have the purple foliage all year round, or sorry, uh, during the growing season. Um, the foliage emerges green, and then it turns this purple color. Again, we're in the same neighborhood. We're in the 20 to 25 range, maybe a little bit bigger than Prairie Fire, maybe a little bit bigger than Red Butt. But this is a tree that gives you uh, a little bit more. You, you get rid of the, the flowers fade, and then you have the purple foliage. You get a little bit of fall color. There's a little bit of Rob Peter to pay Paul in some of the colored foliage trees where the genetics, for whatever reason, give you color during the fall, and then you don't get quite as much fall color. I said. Uh, color during the summer, but then not quite as much fall color. Dwarf chinkapin oak. Uh, this is one that would also fit. This is a little more shrubby look. We are experimenting with seeing if we can turn these into single stems. But for the moment, most of what you see in the dwarf chinkapin oak is a, is a shrubby oak. This is in the 12 to 15 range, high and wide. It is a member of the white oak family, so it sets acorns relatively early. So the squirrels and the blue jays in your neighborhood will be very happy with you if you plant one of these. It's relatively densely branched. I don't know that it's necessarily nesting habitat as much as it is cover. Um, it is a native oak. It is a keystone genera. If you use some of the terminology out of Doug Tallamy's research group at the University of Delaware, um, that supports a lot of local lepidopterans that create lots of larvae or larva for local songbirds. Not a whole lot of fall color. You get a yellow, you get a brown. The oaks are nowhere near spectacular as the maple in terms of fall color. So you do get some yellow depending on the season, depending on the year. Last year, we got a little bit of red out of some of them, but a lot of years you just get yellow turning to brown. The pawpaw is another understory option for you. Uh, this would be a fruiting tree, again, you see flowers that come before foliage, and then you see the fruit there on the left. Uh, tastes pretty good, depending on texture. If you like texture, some people say it tastes like bananas. Uh, it tends to grow in groves. It will colonize, so you may start with one pawpaw, and then maybe you'll have more pawpaws. And so this is something that probably needs to be tucked in a corner. This is not a front yard street tree. Uh, but this is something that gets tucked in the corner, perhaps under the shade of something else, perhaps something that gives you a little bit of afternoon shade. You could tuck a pop off underneath. And there's the leaves. You have these nice uh, palm-like leaves, very large leaves. Uh, again, you have a little bit of a layered structure. It's not necessarily an upright tree, but there's some layered structure to its, its uh, growth habit. The shad below service berry. This is a native service berry, or at least very close to native from the north. Uh, a wispy tree. You see we have white flowers with a little bit of pink maybe before the leaves emerge. You will get berries in the, in the summertime. Uh, good luck. The birds will likely beat you to them, but they are delicious. And then in the fall, you'll get a nice selection of color. So this is a tree that's going to be everything we've talked about so far, I would consider small. We're in the 15 to 20 to 25 range. And if you start talking, you know, well, this is 23 feet and that tree is 25 feet, that's 25 feet is too big. I, I think we're, you know, we're picking nits at that point. So 20, 25, you know, is basically the same size tree. So we're gonna move up now to medium. So the next one would be the ironwood or the American hop horn beam. This is Australia Virginiana. Uh, Interesting leaf shape, um, not quite arrowhead, but you see the serrated edge there on the right. 
and the fruit, the paper bract on the fruit uh, looks like hops. Uh, you can see a lot of these if you were to go hiking in Platte River State Park, especially if you get uh, to the part of the arm of the park that has the glamping cabins and then you walk down towards the waterfalls, towards the river, you will see a lot of bees as understory. And that is their habit. They are an understory tree. This one here on the left looks like it's out in the middle of a yard, but they are an understory tree. And then you get a little bit of fall color out of them. I cheated here. This is not actually a hop horn bean. This is a horn bean, which is Carpinus. But you get similar color. You get a, a gold, a bronze, uh, maybe a little bit of orange in there. So you have some interesting fall color as an understory component in your landscape. The shingle oak. A uh, shingle oak is interesting. Uh, it really holds on to its leaves. We have some shingle oaks in our windbreak here at Great Plains that still have their leaves on and they are exposed in the south windbreak. So they are tenaciously held. Um, it's a medium sized oak. We're in the 45 range. Um, a little bit of red color, perhaps, maybe mostly going to bronze or brown. Uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. So it works very well in a windbreak. It can serve very well in windbreak uh, as a deciduous tree because of its marcescence. The leaves don't drop. And so you get that windbreak character even into the wintertime in that particular portion of your windbreak. Um, again, this is something where you understand that the tree is not dead. It's holding its leaves and I'm going to rake them in the fall to keep the grass from matting down. And then I'm going to rake them again in the spring. And so you just have to understand that that's what's going to happen. But again, this is an oak. It's in the Quercus genera. It's a keystone species. It's something that's going to be very supportive of local wildlife. The shingle oak, or maybe a little bit west, I think it comes up into southeast Nebraska a little bit. I have a good friend that lives in Falls City, or sorry, in uh, Brownville, and he can grow anything there, right? So southeast Nebraska, between moisture, temperature, um, the shingle oak is probably up into that area, maybe not necessarily native out to where we are, but very close. You see the, the leaves there. The leaves are interesting in the oak in that it doesn't look anything like an oak. Uh, it looks more like a bay leaf that you would put in your stew on Sunday morning, but it, it's, a great, it's a great tree. The chinkapin oak is the larger cousin of the dwarf chinkapin oak. Um, I think some places even call the dwarf chinkapin a subspecies of the chinkapin oak. Um, we're into a medium tree here. We're in 40 to 45 foot. You see the serrated edges on the leaf, very similar to the chinkapin oak, the dwarf chinkapin oak. It's a white oak as well. We have acorns at an early stage, uh, three, four, five years, somewhere in there. And then a nice thing about the chinkapin oak is it has some nice exfoliating bark. So you have some winter interest. It drops its leaves because it's a white oak, but it does have some exfoliating bark that adds some winter interest. The black cherry. So now we're kind of moving between medium into larger trees. So the black cherry tends to be a little bit more of a moist species, although it looks like that one is up on the hilltop. It could be a little bit on the other side where it's a little more more moist, a little more riparian. You see its spring behavior. They have beautiful white flowers. You see some behavior. We see berries that are beloved by birds. Um, I had some in the greenhouse that had berries and the birds were flying into the greenhouse uh, to find the berries. So they are beloved by birds. These are ones that you know could very well end up on your neighbor's windshield. And so you may want to you know, fire up the oven and make a batch of brownies to take over there when the black cherries come into fruit. And then finally you get some, some color out of the black cherry. So I like the black cherry when I talk to customers because they want fall color. And so here's something that I can give them that gives them, it's a native tree that gives very consistent or relatively consistent fall color. Perhaps not as brilliant as an autumn blaze, blaze maple or as a red sunset maple, but there's some interest there. There's definitely some reds. There's definitely some golds. There's definitely some oranges. And it's a tree that will do well around here. This is a tough tree that uh, is going to be successful. The hackberry. This is probably, people probably hold this one off the side a little bit. But this is a, another tough Nebraska tree. This is a tree that was made to live on the plains. <clears throat> And we know this because they grow anywhere the birds plant them, in your fence line, uh, your garden beds, uh, the rock pile, 
they they grow anywhere. Uh, they're a tough tree. They're a rounded tree, a rounded canopy. I guess they've got a couple knocks against them. One of them is that they are not very good at compartmentalizing disease. So that if you have a tree branch or if you uh, a branch that's broken during a storm, or if you have like at my house in the right of way behind my house, the electric companies had to come prune the hackberry back. So if you've got an open wound, they're not so good at compartmentalizing disease and then maybe some hollow branches. But if you look at it another way, now I now have a place for woodpeckers to live. I have, you know, it, it adds some interest in that regard. Um, has great bark. This, this three-dimensional corky uh, knobby bark is great. And then you always see uh, these nipple galls on hackberry. It's, it's a symbiotic relationship between a mite and the leaf. The, the mite bites the leaf. I'm not sure if this one is a mite or an insect. I don't want to speak correctly, but it bites the leaf. The leaf responds and you have this gall that produces this on the back of the leaves, which some people find unsightly. Uh, I find it kind of interesting. Another thing about the hackberry is it kind of understands Nebraska. And so if we get to the middle of a really hot, dry summer, the hackberry just may say, you know what, I'm done. It just may go dormant, drop its leaves, and just wait until next year. And so people may think it's dead. They may think that's unsightly, but the hackberry says, you know what? It's 100 degrees outside. It's dry. I, I'm just going to take it easy. Coffee tree. Um, this is a cool tree. I like the coffee tree. Uh, a very rounded canopy. And again, we're getting, this isn't a huge one, but we're getting into bigger trees now. They're going to take more space and more consideration for where you put them in your landscape. Um, a rounded canopy, it grows incredibly slow. Uh, incredibly is maybe a little bit of overstatement, but it does grow slow. Certainly not as fast as some of the maples or the oaks or catalpas or some of the other things we might talk about. Uh, you can see there on the right, the exfoliating bark or this scaly recurved bow look to the bark as it gets older. Um, it has a very gnarly look. And I think I have a picture of the winter structure. You can see the winter structure there on the right. It's almost got this haunted tree characteristic to it. You put that up against a gray sky uh, and it's just really nice to look at. You can see the pods. So this is a tree that has both male and female trees. So it is possible to see coffee trees that do not have any pods. Um, and those are trees that had male flowers. The, the trees with fruit or pods were the female trees. So in the landscape business, you will find trees that are primarily male trees. You can't find the straight species, but you will find branded cultivars. One is uh, espresso. I think there's a new one called skinny latte that do not have pods. And so people will plant those in their landscapes. And I can tell you from my uh, experience in retail garden center, that if you are in a business where you're trying to convince a customer to buy a coffee tree, good luck because you will get them and they look like a stick. And you're trying to convince a customer that this is a tree that's going to grow up into something rounded and beautiful. And it's just a hard sell. So you really, you got to talk it up. You got to work it. There are ways to get a little better branching out of them. But the ones I've seen that come from a lot of uh, vendors, uh, nurseries are, are sticks. And it's, it's interesting to have that conversation with someone. Here's the Northern Catalpa. So now we're getting into great big trees, right? So the Catalpa is easily... 50, 60, 70 feet, uh, not quite as wide as it is tall um, and absolutely beautiful. You see the, the orchid-like flowers in the summertime. Uh, if you live in Lincoln, there's a couple of these on North Cotter Street, oh, just north of Holdridge, a couple of blocks. I think there's three in a row. And when they are in bloom, the entire side of the tree that you can see from Cotner is in bloom with these white flowers. And it's, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Um, they are orchid-like, so you've got a little bit of character to them there in terms of the, you can see the little striping in them. Um, I would say that they make wonderful targets for hail. So if you've got a hailstorm, you've got a catalpa, and you've got a hailstorm, you're going to have very tattered leaves. So it's going to look a little bit rugged for a while. Um, but that's mother nature, right? You can either punch holes in your leaves or strip them completely off. So you pick your poison when it comes to a hailstorm. 
Uh, the American Sycamore, uh, I'm seeing more of these in Lincoln, or I've, I'm beginning to notice more would be a better term in Lincoln. And this is another tree, probably the biggest of the ones we've got there. You can see what the structure is of an American Sycamore. Uh, great horizontal scaffold branches, uh, the camouflage bark. Uh, you will see the seed balls in the tree. They tend not to be self-seeding. So even though you have seed balls in the yard, you don't have a little forest of sycamore trees that show up in your yard. And then there's the camo bark. Uh, you can get the same look out of the plane tree, uh, the London plane tree. There's a couple cultivars available, which is a uh, cross of two species of um, plantanus. So, but the plane tree works around here as well, has the camouflage bark and is not as large. Uh, so it maybe fits in a spot a little bit better than the sycamore. One thing to keep in mind about sycamore is they can get anthracnose. And so you may have some brown spots on your leaves. You can get some leaf drop early in the spring if we have a wet, moist spring. And so then the leaves may drop, the may, leaves may look unsightly, but then they'll rebud. They typically have an, a, an axillary bud or a secondary bud that will sprout. So that's the trees. Um, there's plenty of trees to pick from that aren't included on this list. Uh, the Green Streets plan in Omaha, I think you can probably just type that in and find that. Um, you know, it's how Omaha is trying to urbanize some of their larger boulevards and streets. And they have at the very back of that plan, um, a couple of pages of street trees and ornamental trees. Some of which we've talked about today, some of which uh, I didn't talk about. And then the city of Lincoln has an approved street tree list. You can find that on the city of Lincoln's website uh, under park and recs and then community forestry. Uh, their list is sorted by size, shape, color, and whether or not it's a native species. And they do have maples on the list, but the city of Lincoln is not letting uh, maples be planted as street trees. You can still plant them in your own yard, but you can't plant them as street trees. Uh, they're not limited to use as street trees. So the, the list would be an effective uh, starter for you to determine what do I want to look at? What do, I, what do I think? I didn't really like anything that Tim told me. What else is out there? Uh, most of those are going to be available in local garden centers in the Lincoln and Omaha area. But there is no indication of site preference on those particular trees. So then, you know, if you need a tree for a moist spot, you need a tree for a dry spot, then you're going to have to do a little bit more research on your own to find a tree that might work. Make sure you're asking those questions. Um, and the, the question that I, or the slide that I had earlier about plant it right, plant it well, excuse me, uh, right plant, right place. Those are the questions you need to be asking your garden center guys. When you go to talk to them, um, they need to be listening to you. You need to be asking the questions and they need to be giving you the answers that are going to meet what you need for your spot. Some other resources to get some great ideas for trees. Uh, the Nebraska Forest Service, state Ar statewide arboretum. I think if you peruse uh, the statewide arboretum, probably has the more easiest website to navigate. You'll be able to find, uh, but those two are connected. So I don't mean the forest website is bad. Um, you probably find trees for Eastern Nebraska, trees for Western Nebraska, uh, trees by dry, trees by moist. They're, they're very well divided, so you should be able to find something that works there. Uh, Missouri Botanical Gardens, if you can find a tab called Plant Finder, you can do a lot of research. You can find uh, size. You can find a lot of picture of mature plants. You can find disease information, insect information. Uh, where does, which zone does it work in? Missouri Botanical Gardens is in St. Louis. But they are very good about saying this tree works well in St. Louis, but be careful if you go somewhere else. So it's a great website. I use it a lot, even with customers or for my research, to find information uh, about different trees. Uh, the National Wildlife Federation, uh, you can find information about keystone plants. And that's a topic for an entire another webinar. Um, and key, uh, keystone plants that are uh, critical to local birds and insects. And then finally, our own website, Great Plains Nursery, has a lot of information about all the trees that we care. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, you can send me an email there. If you have any questions, you can give me a call. Uh, most of the time I'm here, I'm usually try to sit in the office in the mornings, and then I'm out in the nursery in the afternoon. As we get more into the growing season, I'll be 
out and about more uh, and away from the phone, but I try to check an email multiple times a day and I try to get back to people relatively quickly. 